Hello, everyone. Uh, we're so excited that you're here with us this evening. My name is Noga Ginsburg, and I'm the co-president of the Israel Business Association and a business school student here at Columbia. My name is Eden Yadigar, and I'm a junior at the School of General Studies and the president of Students Supporting Israel. First and foremost, we would like to say a huge thank you to all the people that made tonight's event possible. We are immensely grateful for our generous sponsors, to the public safety team, and for the support at everyone, excuse me, from everyone at Columbia University that helped make our idea become a reality. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge all the incredibly courageous students in this room and online that worked tirelessly to advocate for truth, for coexistence, and for sustained dialogue and peace on campus and beyond. In the spirit of courage, we have the privilege of hearing from a remarkable individual who constantly puts his life on the line in pursuit of truth and justice. Mr. Musab Hassan Youssef serves as a voice of freedom and peace in the Middle East and beyond. He brings hope not only to those of us living in the United States, but also to an entire generation who, without a new way of thinking, are destined to follow in the destructive patterns of the past. Mr. Youssef was born in Ramallah to a founding family of the political wing of Hamas, an internationally recognized terrorist organization that is directly responsible for countless suicide bombings and deadly attacks against Israelis. Mr. Youssef played a role in Hamas and was imprisoned for more than 27 months by the Shin Bet, the Israeli intelligence service. While in prison, he discovered Hamas was torturing its own people and the relentless, relentless search for collaborators. He began to question who his enemies really were, Israel, America, Hamas. Since then, Mr. Youssef has revealed critical information about one of the world's most dangerous terrorist organizations and unveils the truth about his own former secretive role, his agonizing separation from family and homeland, and his dangerous choices in hope for genuine and lasting peace in the region. Mr. Youssef has spoken at the United Nations and has conferred with ambassadors, presidents, prime ministers, and state officials from governments around the world, providing a unique perspective from inside Hamas. He is the author of the book, Son of Hamas, and his next book, From Hamas to America, is coming out in August. We are honored to have him here with us tonight. Joining him in conversation will be Columbia Business School professor Ran Kivitz, who is an expert in topics of decision-making, behavioral economics, marketing strategy, consumer behavior, and innovation. His latest research explored political science through the lens of decision-making. He's committing to the fight against anti-Semitism on US campuses. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Musab Hassan Youssef and Professor Ran Kivitz. I guess we'll start uh, we're a little bit late. Uh, apologies to the audience at home and here. We, we are both from the Middle East after, after all, so <laughs> just a tiny bit late. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Noga, Eden. Um, you want me to use this? Better? OK. Um, thank you so much uh, to Noga and Eden and all, all the students, uh, undergraduate students, business school students, graduate students, uh, for your um, uh, tenacity, your perseverance, your wisdom, your action, and for making this event uh, possible, of course, to you, Mr. Uh, Yusuf, for uh, being, uh, being here with us, and for all the audience, both here and, and at home, thanks so much for attending this, uh, what we think is a very important event. Mr. Yusuf, I'll cut to the chase. This is your book. It's a bestseller book in the New York Times, and the title is Son of Hamas a uh, gripping account of uh, terror, betrayal, political intrigue, and unthinkable choices. One of the words caught my, uh, caught my uh, attention in particular, and that's the word uh, betrayal. There are those who accuse you of betraying Palestinians. Are they right? Are they wrong? What's the answer? Well, first of all, good evening to everyone, and thank you for having me. It's a great honor. Um, yes, this is my choice. Uh, I choose the world, betrayal, because 
Um, the eve of publishing this book, I knew that my, my people would label me as a traitor. Uh, it's not like uh, I was uh, committing a crime and they cut me in the act, then this is my punishment. I walked away and I should not feel guilty about saving human lives because this is what I did. Now, if a majority of my society believe that saving a human life, stopping a suicide bomber from blowing up himself and killing many civilians in the process, if they think that this is okay, I don't have to think the same way. And if my punishment for saving a human life is to be shunned, to be accused of treason, and sentenced to death, then be it. They can say whatever, and, and traitor or treason, according who? Hamas? Well, how about the entire system will come down? Then what is it going to be? One individual against an entire society praising suicide bombing attacks? And if someone goes against it, the only weapon they have to just say that this is treason, anybody tries to get them out of their comfort and challenge their narrative to help them get out of the cave of delusion, what we become, we become traitors. I knew what I was getting myself into and they can say whatever they want to say. It's their problem. I know what I am and I know who I am. It's interesting you used to It's interesting, you use the word choice. I've been studying human choice uh, for 30 years. I'm still not uh, sure do we have choice, do we make choices or not, but perhaps what we can do is we're not chosen where we're born. You were born um, wherever you were born, but we do choose, you did choose, and uh, how we cope with it, what we do with that. And speaking of where you were born and, and your childhood, can you tell us a little bit about, about your childhood and also more generally, how, what, what is it like to be uh, a child or, or a woman or a, a homosexual individual under Hamas rule? Well, the last one you need to ask the homosexuals. <laughs> I don't know how it feels like for a homosexual in the Palestinian territories, but it's not acceptable, you know. Um, and uh, it's a very close society. Um, me as a child, I was uh, abused uh, by older people. I was beaten up. And of course, you know, I really avoid to talk about this. Uh, even in my book, you know, I honored my father, I honored my people. I did not want to insult them or uh, to make them look bad. But uh, today, I choose to make myself vulnerable. And unfortunately, you know, when you make yourself vulnerable, people think that you are weak, you know. So this is why I avoid to talk about this stuff. But the amount of violence that I had to witness, and I'm not the only one, you know, it was okay, and it's still okay to beat up a child. You know, they do it at schools, they do it in the mosque, in the homes, in the street. It's a very violent culture. And I don't mean, you know, to, um, to make them look bad, but there is lots of abuse and there is lots of violence when it comes to children. And as a child of that region, you know, and unfortunately the children that we see today in Gaza and we see them everywhere suffering because of the poor decisions and the choices that the leadership is, is making, they don't have anyone to speak on their behalf. You know, many people here on the streets protesting and speak, advocating on behalf of the children, but they fail to condemn Hamas, the reason who's causing all this trouble. And now, nobody, ha nobody actually is advocating on behalf of those children because they cannot discern. They cannot see things for what they are. And as a child of that region, uh, somebody have to speak up. 
or somebody has to speak up, has to stand up against those monsters. Otherwise, the cycle of violence will go for eternity. So it was not a nice childhood. And it's still not a nice childhood. Today, after 45 years, and I'm nothing but eyewitness. I'm not an expert on the thing. I did not come to the United States to publish books. I didn't think that you could make money out of books. I just wanted to speak on behalf of this continuing tragedy that the people, the leaders of what's so-called revolution don't care for the children. You know, and if I was able to fight the good fight and just stay standing on my feet, this is too much. And who's fighting on behalf of the children if we keep empowering the predators, the criminals who have been using them for so long by the name of revolution and by the name of Palestine? Who cares about all the political entities? Let them go down to hell and let the people live. Let the children, the future of the children is what really matters. Not some hypothetical political entity everybody is fighting for. Who cares for another Arab country in the region? if it doesn't take the children into consideration. I'm, I'm trying to think what uh, Sinwar would, would uh, how he would debate you. I don't like um, um, role-playing uh, Sinwar and he's sitting in some, uh, um, running around in some cellar, uh, saving himself, but uh, Maybe Sinwar would say, well, why are you saying this? We, we are fighting for the freedom, the dignity, uh, the independence, the national independence of these children. We are fighting to give these children a, a future. How is it that uh, we are um, abusing them? How is it that, uh, or Hania in, where is he, in Qatar, or some professors in universities? What, what am I missing? Look, this is the game of the con artists who came throughout what's so-called the Palestinian revolution, throughout the history of the conflict. You know, at some point of their revolution, they realized that they could become billionaires and get a global status because who really would care about the president or the prime minister of a country in the Middle East, or let's say a Palestine? Who would care about them? But as rev revolutionary leaders, they got status, they got power, they got lots of money, and they forgot why they started. And the people are just fuel. The children, how many, like in Gaza, in the past few wars, let's say the last one, the Hamas claimed that 1,000 children died. You know how much Hamas got money in return for the children death? close to one billion dollars. This is one million dollars a head. Okay. And the more they exaggerate the statistics, the more the, the international community give them money. This is their game. They want the children to die. You think somebody like Sinwar did not realize that Israel is going to, co to come to Gaza strong? He knew. He wanted the civilian casualty. This is why he's putting booby traps all over the Gaza Strip so the children can die. And when the children die, he gets money in return. This is how the international community been trying to silence the Hamas and the Palestinian revolution intimidation by paying them off. And the more you give them money, the more violent they become. They started 20 years ago, suicide bombing attacks. Today they're committing a genocide on October 7, and they are using the Gazans as human shields. And instead of understanding the game and cutting the aid, don't give them more money. What we are doing, we're just going around like idiots saying free, free Palestine. You raised a few, um, mentioned a few very loaded uh, words. Uh, genocide, um, the deaths of, of children. I would add, uh, people are saying that uh, there's been, uh, I think somebody in the EU, maybe the foreign minister of the EU, said that Israel is using um, starvation as a, and if you didn't say it, I apologize, but I think they said that Israel may be using uh, starvation as a military tool. And uh, Hamas, uh, the um, health ministry is saying 30,000 people have died. Um, my question, there is a question. 
Um, some people are saying Israel is committing a, a genocide and, and starving, and, and other people are saying, um, Israel, you've got to put in more aid or more food. And Israel is saying, um, this is like fire. You cannot put out fire 80% because the 20% that you leave will, will catch back on, like, like cancer, heaven forbid. You cannot leave some part of the cancer. If it's metastasizing, it will kill you. You have to take all of it. So Hamas, Israel is saying, needs to stop rule Gaza. Um, it, it, it almost feels, I mean, what is the truth? What is the reality? It feels like people are looking at different realities. What, what is real here? What, what is really going on? Look, all of the accusations of a genocide, they are baseless. They don't have evidence of anything they say, just propaganda, Hamas propaganda. And this is the reverse psychology. What Hamas did on October 7 was a genocide because it was motivated by hatred against ethnicity. Their goal was to ethnically cleanse people, a human race because of their religion, and because of their uh, uh, ethnicity. So this is what defines a genocide. They wiped out an entire community, more than 20 communities. They, did, they killed everything, every form of life for those who watched Hamas on documented footage of the uh, massacre. Now, what's happening in Gaza? First of all, Israel has the capacity to drop a dirty bomb on Gaza Strip and wipe it off the map. It has that capacity, whether people want to admit it or not. So if it was a matter of ethnic cleansing, why Israel does not just wipe out Gaza off the map or carpet bomb the entire freaking region? Why they don't do it? Why people are not asking this question that Israel is superior in every possible way in Gaza Strip? Why they are not using their full capacity in this war? Instead, Israel was still mourning the genocide that happened on October 7, and it risked its own foot soldiers to send them to Gaza Strip where Hamas put death traps all over the Gaza Strip. Who does that? If it was any other democracy, they would carpet bomb the entire Gaza Strip because the entire society, I don't want to say complicit, but for how many years they voted for Hamas and they supported Hamas ideology. So when we talk about uh, accusations of a genocide, this is nonsense. You need to provide the evidence. Then Israel gave, sent text messages, phone calls, millions of leaflets for those who did not have communication. They gave the people 21 days to evacuate northern Gaza. Like how much a modern day, day army in the face of the most brutal urban warfare that no one, no modern army is prepared for such a war. Where terrorists hijacked an entire society and took human shields. How would you deal with the matter? Israel did everything within their ability. I'm not saying that war is okay. War is ugly. People die in war. Then it was Hamas. They started with the genocide. Then they took their own people as human shields. Then they took hostages. Then after that, they lied about the statistics. And they used footage from other locations for their propaganda from old wars, from other regions, from Syria, even from earthquake disasters, to just magnify uh, a false narrative. A false narrative that started some 70 years ago, a narrative of a victim that without being a victim, they cannot exist. Those are the people that I grew up with and my fault, because I choose not to be a victim, because my choice is to fight for myself, and we cannot just blame Israel on everything. So those who accuse Israel of genocide, they should be held or held accountable, because this is a very serious accusation, very serious accusation, and it's baseless. You, you mentioned uh, um, 
the religion, I assume you're talking about Hamas and in, in their charter, in terms of religion, they say, find uh, every Jew hiding behind every tree and kill them with a stone in their head. And um, so it's their version, distorted version, I think, of what should be um, any religion's uh, goal of, of peace. You mentioned the people, Mr. Yusuf, I know, I know, but uh, <laughs> you mentioned the, the people supporting Hamas. And there is a, you know, by the way, the data that is coming out, uh, as much as you can trust up um, voting polls, are saying that uh, support of Hamas in the uh, Palestinian Authority is, I think, over 80%, and in Gaza is, is only 70-something percent. But you said the population is supporting Hamas. And there is a conception, or some people are saying, Hamas is different from the people. People do not want Hamas. And of course, I would want to believe that. But how did we come to this point? How, how is it? Uh, I mean, I'm asking the most maybe uh, straightforward question. I mean, how did they hijack Gaza against the will of 90% of the people? It's an uncomfortable question. Or did they have broad support? How did we come to the point we're at? Look, some 36 years ago, when Hamas wrote their own charter, and I think my father participated in writing Hamas charter. I think he's one of the main authors of that. That was his thing. Um, the difference between theory and practice. You know, when you write such a thing, it might sound fancy or romantic. You know, you're talking about liberating the land. Uh, it's, uh, you're fighting for the cause. Uh, you're defending the people uh, against uh, colonizers, all type of propaganda and false uh, 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 history, I'd say then, okay, you're motivated by some noble cause, let's say. Then you go and write in a charter, but you don't realize that you're writing a genocide. It wasn't until 36 years later when they manifested their charter into reality. That was October 7th. That was the manifestation of Hamas charter. It was there. I have been saying that Hamas is bad news. For how long? I made my book available in Arabic, for free, because most of the Palestinians don't understand the real dynamic of Hamas. You may think that if you were born in the Palestinian society, you understand Hamas, you understand Israel, you understand all other Palestinian factions, all other political gangs. But the truth, no. People don't understand. This is an underground organization. They are very sophisticated. They are very dangerous. This is why I put my life on the line to write this, I don't want to say stupid book. Because I lost everything because of this book, trying to bring to the truth to the people. And instead of people listening, I got canceled everywhere. And labeled as Islamophobe to just challenge the ideology to say that we cannot coexist with savages who want to dominate the world. They don't have equal rights because criminals don't have equal rights. Rapists don't have equal rights to decent civilians. In fact, all the prisoners, the moment they get in prison, they are stripped from their, many of their rights. They have human rights, but they don't have all the rights. So when we are dealing with criminals who, went, who want to dominate the globe, they don't want only a Palestinian state. This is just a lie. They are using the uh, national uh, identity as Palestinians, where there is no such a thing in reality, only a cover. It's a device. It's a vessel that is helping them to go to the next level. So with that said, even Hamas members don't understand what Hamas is. Very dangerous organization, very sophisticated, multi-layers of security, of 
And a handful of people are in charge of this. And you know who those people? They're not even in the Palestinian territories at all. They are in Turkey, they are in Qatar, they are in the United States of America, channeling money, collecting donations, using all type of uh, uh, covers for their uh, operation, financial operation. They are billionaires. Then, when they say free Palestine, this is just a fancy romantic thing. And who's paying the price for what so-called Palestine except the poor children, those are the fuel for what's so-called Palestine. And the leaders don't want Palestine. They don't want a state. They don't want to be involved in the politics ruling the people because with governing come responsibility. They just want to sit on the throne of a revolution and keep taking people, keep, keep taking money for blood. That's their game. The occasion, blood for money. That's their game. Anyone else who say that their objection is to emancipate or liberate the territory, they're not fighting for land. So the people don't know, and I don't blame the people. In fact, many people who voted for Hamas, they're driven by, by Islam, by, by a religion, because Hamas lied to them and posed as an Islamic uh, national movement. So if I to go into the matrix of this problem, we would never end. It's a rabbit hole. I wish it was only Hamas. If we were dealing only with one political entity, or let's say religious fanatics, then we may apply some pl uh, pressure and try to bring them to negotiating table, but we are de dealing with multiple headed snake. We have how many Palestinian gangs and that's the problem with the people who want to give a Palestine. And I say, well, how about a legitimate representative of what so-called Palestine? Because we cannot deal with so many heads. Hamas want from the river to the sea. The PA want a different territory. Islamic Jihad, they have different idea. And there is no democracy that can compensate every group and satisfy their political ambition, not even the United States of America. And up to this point, the Palestinians failed to elect a legitimate representative of Palestine. So I can go on and on. This is the tragedy. This is why, and please forgive me, you know, for my emotions, there is no other mean for me. You know, this is not how. I like to be every day, but such a tragedy and the level of false narrative on the street of so many wannabes who just enjoying the cause. They have joined the cause finally. They found their purpose. They don't know Palestine. They don't know the territory. They don't know that it's not a country. It's not a nation. We are dealing with so many terrorist groups on the ground that they are divided. And I think the root cause of this trouble in the Middle East, that actually Palestinians are incapable of deciding on a central leadership. And their division is exported towards Israel. Every time they fail to get united, they blame it on Israel and they launch a war against Israel. So this is just part of the reality and this is the human emotion. If there is any child would be sitting here, I am the child of the land, I live the pain of that land and we cannot let this continue for eternity. We have to put an end to this. You know, Palestinians, <laughs> Palestinians deserve, Palestinians deserve a governing authority. I'm not saying no to that. We can give them that. We can give them education, we can give them economy, but it does not have to be a corrupt leadership they don't care for the people. They don't care for the people. You don't need to apologize for uh, being emotional or vulnerable. There's no, uh, no positive change, no growth without being uh, vulnerable and uh, emotional in human affairs. We also obviously want to look at facts. And 
speaking of facts, and part of the reason we're here is because of the uh, eruption of anti-Semitism on American campuses, on many American campuses, since October 7. We have been seeing rallies, even with professors, where there are chants, Yemen, Yemen, make me proud, turn another ship around. That's actually also negative America. Or from the river to the sea, Palestine will be Arab. Or death to the Zionist uh, state. And my question, what, what is the relationship between, if any, between anti-Semitism and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Anti-Semitism is wrong in principle. We cannot generalize the people. You know, the Jewish people are very peaceful people. It's not that, you know, I, uh, I worked for Israel for 10 years undercover, you know. And many people, this is why they label me as a traitor and they say that this is bias and this is uh, not credible, etc. Whatever they want to say. But this was my experience uh, in a democratic system and democratic establishment where Israel values the human life. We were in so many critical situations where civilians were involved. The war in Gaza, recent one, this is a, an exception because uh, like how many foot soldiers you can risk, you know, in order for you to eradicate such group, you know, who built hundreds of miles of tunnels and turned every household, every hospital, every school into a shooting pad. It's an unimaginable situation, such a crisis. When we were in operation, we had a terrorist sometimes and his daughter was in the car. We had been looking for the terrorist for six months and he was flying below our radar. And when finally surfaced and we were able to locate him, I was part of the operation. He got in the car and his daughter was in the car. So I called the operation room and I said, his daughter in the car. And the operation was canceled immediately. This is the Israeli intelligence I know. We follow protocol. Why would we want to target any civilian? It's insane. For 10 years. This is a 10-year experience with the Israeli intelligence that they've been accused right now of killing Gazan civilians. It's not possible. But what Hamas did in Gaza also is beyond impossible. And many people took advantage of the situation. They uh, found an opportunity to blame and attack the successful minority. It's not a secret that Jewish people are very successful people. And now everybody had an issue or they have a situation, they try to settle their differences in a very mean way. While Israel is fighting existential fight, they came to stab Israel in the back and the Jewish people in the back. If I had to say Israel, what's the fault of the Jewish people in the United States? What did they do? Why harass them? Why accuse them of the genocide? Why to go after them? They are not the government. They are just the people. So this shows you that these people see the ones who are accusing uh, the Jews, the Zionists. What's this? The Zionists is a legitimate political organization in the United States. It's a legal one. Everything they do is open to the public, it's not secret, there's no conspiracy, but people make a conspiracy out of everything. So I don't know how to stop this, this is the human delusion, and this is how people twist the narrative. In fact, if you just look, what happened on October 7, by all standards, is a genocide. I've been to those places, I saw all the footage, the raw images. 
that public did not see. What they did was ethnic cleansing. But you know, the victim, the only victim of a genocide did not complain about it. And the only victim in this situation is Israel. And the Jewish people cannot talk about it. You know why? Because it's a trauma. No one in the Jewish community want to admit that they have failed again. And they allowed another genocide to happen to the Jewish people with all the preparations that they have. It's just a sense of guilt that they don't want to admit it. From day one, I told them, guys, you have to build your case in the world. You just suffer the genocide. You cannot be silent about it. And they still not say. But within a few weeks, the Hamas and the Palestinian Authority and the Arab, the Muslim world, two billion people managed somehow to turn the narrative upside down. It became a Palestinian genocide and a Palestinian ethnic cleansing. While all the evidence on the ground contradicts or contradict their claims. So this is how fast with the social media, how people are able to twist the narrative. I'm not saying people are not suffering in Gaza. You think we don't have hearts. You think I've been with the soldiers. We cried. Those soldiers in Gaza right now fighting, they have family, they have children. You think they don't feel towards the children? But such an ugly situation that Hamas turned every sacred, every safe zone into a bloodbath. What would you do if you were in the situation? So now all these mediocres, they come and they hijack the situation and they spread hatred. This is their game. And it's really unbelievable. If I was watching a movie, I would think like, wow, this is unreal. This is the United States of America. You know, it's not only Israel is an ally of the United States, but for Israel for all the values, the democratic values, to be accused of an apartheid. While we have 1.5 million Arab citizens in Israel that actually don't have equal responsibilities like the Jewish citizens. Because they, don't, they are not forced to serve in the IDF, while all the Jews are forced to go to the IDF, to serve in the military. The Arabs have the privilege not to go to war, but they still enjoy the rights as the rest of the country. How can you say that this is an apartheid? In my opinion, the Jewish citizens have a lot more risk than the Arab citizens of the state of Israel. But, but um, and by the way, there are uh, Muslim and Christian and Jews, uh, Arabs, uh, citizens of Israel that do serve in, in the Israeli military. And there's also Jews that do not serve, and, and it's all good. I'm not opining on that. But when you say it's not a, an apartheid, they would say, what about uh, Judea and Samora or the West Bank or the Palestinian territories? You choose your, your terminology. Isn't that apartheid? They would say, or people are saying, well, Israel laid the siege on Gaza. Isn't that apartheid? You see, this is the problem of what's so-called, I think, before the, uh, the uh, pro-Palestine or free Palestine movement, there was the BDS, and there's still the BDS, where they recruited a huge number of intellectuals, historians, artists, actors, wherever you know, they were able to reach. Uh, using, of course, the Arab oil money. Uh, these people are so twisted, I cannot even, uh, it's beyond my comprehension. Because how can you take the values of democracy in the West and try to apply it to a region that does not actually believe in democracy? So, not taking consideration the security needs of a democracy that is under cons uh, consistent threat by terrorists. So when we talk about the Finns, I remember the waves of suicide bombing attacks. You know, was multiple suicide bombing attacks on a regular basis. We have dozens of those. And 
Israel had no choice but to build the wall. Before this wall, my memory as a child, my father and I were able to drive our car from the town of Ramallah all the way to Yafo, to Tel Aviv, to the beach, to the zoo, pretty much every weekend. And nobody harassed us. We were able to just shop. We were able to enjoy the beach. This is my early memory as a child. There was not even one checkpoint. Things start changing immediately after the beginning of the first Palestinian Intifada. It started with the chant from the river to the sea. Very romantic. Soon later, it became stabbing. Shortly later, it became mass shooting. Within no time, it became suicide bombing attacks. What a democracy should do in a situation when they are not able to stop the people an entire society. I don't want to say complicit, but the Palestinians praised suicide bombers as martyrs, as heroes of the nation. Look at my case. When I opposed that, I said, no, it's not good. It's bad. It's very bad to kill people indiscriminately. You know, Hamas did not kill people only on October 7. Hamas has a long history of suicide bombing attacks. They blow up universities, schools, buses, markets, beaches. They targeted everywhere. So Israel had to take some security measures. And again, even in the best democracy, when you, when you are under consistent threat, there are exceptions. And some of the civil laws could be actually replaced with some emergency laws. Even the United States did this during the war against, terror, uh, against uh, terrorism. So when you are under consistent threat, it's very different. But somebody can sit in comfort and say, hey, how about we take some of the Western values, the democratic values, and say, oh, look at Israel. They claim to be a democracy, but look how they're treating the Palestinians. Well, terrorists in prison, have they earned equal rights to decent citizens in civilization who know their responsibility and their obligation towards the other, who don't harm the others? Of course not. So sometimes when we are dealing with emergency situation, we cannot say and force the people in the Middle East to just act um, according our values. We sit here in the United States, we don't have suicide bombing attacks, we don't have missile attacks, we don't have infiltration on a regular basis. So we cannot take our values and force Israel to do the same while they are under war. We cannot force Israel to send and risk the lives of thousands of foot soldiers in order for us uh, to reduce or minimize uh, the civilian casualty, which Israel is already doing. But who are we to force Israel how to do the job? It's not, it's not our right. Following up on what you said, I would hope that there is agreement that for the sake of everyone, Hamas cannot continue to rule uh, Gaza or anywhere. If there's disagreement on that, you know, I don't know what to say. But let's assume there's agreement on that. There's still a conflict between Palestinians. There's still a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. What is the resolution? How, how does that get settled? How do, you, how do you see moving forward? Eventually, we want the kids, as you said, all kids, any kid on earth, to prosper and be safe and reach their potential, whatever, whatever they want to be or can be, as long as it's uh, um, not criminal. How do we get there? What's the resolution? Look, I think the violent game is coming to an end finally. You know, the Palestinian intimidation, the use of violence to achieve political uh, 
bargaining chips is finally over. Now Palestinians, Arabs, uh, children of the region, they understand that violence is the dead end. They see Hamas kept building the momentum for 36 years. And what was the outcome? A genocide on the Israeli part and total destruction of Gaza. This is it. This is where violence, violence is dead end. So what we are doing in Gaza right now, we are just sending a very clear message to Hamas and all the Islamists around the globe that violence is a dead end. It doesn't work with democracies. And you will see sooner or later, you will realize the significance and the importance of this war that's taking place today in Gaza because it's a war, it's a fight on behalf of civilization, not only on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people. Now, once Palestinians realize that this does not work, then I don't think it will be a problem to give Palestinians a governing authority. I don't recommend Palestinians to have guns for a long period of time, the same way we did with Japan after the World War II. Japan was disarmed for nearly 50 years. I could be wrong, so don't hold it against me. But for a long period of time, it was disarmed. And I think now what we need, we need a governing authority Okay, not a global authority. They have been trying to globalize the Intifada. You, you've heard them saying this. That's the problem in the Middle East because they want to globalize it. No, we want to localize it. We want the locals of Palestine to be in charge. The most educated, not the most corrupt politicians living in Qatar and elsewhere becoming billionaires. No, we want the locals who care for the people, the most educated, hopefully maybe educated in the West, in the United States, to be in charge. And we can build economy. We can give them a decent police force. They don't need armies right now. And we can open a bridge with the world. By the way, the Gaza blockade and all the claims of open air prison, etc., accusations by the BDS and the uh, pro-Palestine movement, it's not true because Egypt has been closing the border. Not only Israel. Nobody wanted to deal with Gaza governed by Hamas. Now I think that Hamas out of the picture, you will see within no time, Gaza will be free because Israel has no problem. Israel allowed the Gazans to come into its territory to work, to earn, give them job opportunity. And I think Israel has a good plan. I'm not going to reveal it right now because it's a bit early, but it has a, a fantastic plan for Gaza. And Gaza can be the Singapore of the Middle East, South Syria, because it's in Israel's, uh, uh, to Israel's benefit that Gaza thrive, not be poor. But you cannot give power as long as Hamas is in charge. Because what they do with power? So we have to make sure that whoever is going to rule Gaza is a clean uh, government and they are not corrupt and also recognize Israel's right to exist. Then they care for the people. They are from the local, not from the uh, uh, external entity like Iran or Qatar, or any other uh, political entity. So then there is hope. I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's a dead end. No, violence is a dead end. And now we are going to finish it. And I am optimistic that there is going to be a solution. But right now, it's too early to talk about it, as long as we haven't captured Rafah. Rafah needs to be cleansed from the fleeing Hamas uh, savages. They're not freedom fighters. They don't earn my legitimacy. And you should never give them legitimacy. They are outlaw. They are responsible for the death of so many civilians, not only in Israel, but also in Gaza. All the blood in Gaza on Hamas hands. So we have to finish them in Rafah, whatever that takes. And Israel has been taking 
all the necessary measures. They have a plan to evacuate the civilians out of Rafah so we can minimize the civilians' casualties and take Hamas' strongest card. So there will be time to talk about peace, about building the economy and the post-war uh, uh, era. Musab and, and the audience and everyone, I you know, apologize for the, for the noise. Noise is a part of life. We need to let the facts and, and the, your voice, I think, and the facts is rising way above the noise. I promise that would be my last question, but I'm a professor. Professors can't stop talking, so I got to have one more question. You know, we've, you've spoken about Israelis and Jews and Palestinians and Arabs and even universities. There's one um, entity that did not come up, and I, I'm just wondering about it. We've never spoken about it. I don't know what your opinion is, and that is Iran. Iran. Do they have a role in this, in how we got here, where we go forward, or is Iran separate from this, has nothing to do with this? Iran is the uh, master of all this tragedy. They are the ones who have been funding Hamas, Hezbollah, and all the other proxies in the region, including the Houthis right now, interrupting all the international and global trade. Uh, and they have aspiration of becoming a nuclear power. You know, we really cannot afford the Iran nuclear power. You know, if you give them a mass destruction weapon, this type of people who actually don't believe in, our, in any of our values. We cannot give them our intellectual property. We cannot give them our science. We cannot give them because they're not responsible. You know, you share this type of uh, knowledge with people who are responsible, people who know their responsibility, not some suicidal, crazy regime like Iran, destabilizing the entire Middle East uh, region, they wanted to ignite a global war, not only a regional war, orchestrated by Russia. They're anti-America. They're anti the American interest, global interest, and they don't qualify. You know, and many Americans make the mistake, by the way, by thinking, okay, this is not our problem. No. We, as Americans, we are the superpower. And with superpower, we have responsibilities. We cannot run away from our responsibilities. I'm not saying we are policing the world. We should not interfere with people's democracies, etc. Even though some American politicians lately, you know, they are interfering with other democracies' choices. But we have responsibilities towards the world. So when we see the bad guys about to obtain a nuclear weapon, it's our responsibility to do everything within our ability to stop that from happening before it's too late. We don't just see a group like Hamas putting a child in an oven and taking a video of that, a reminder of what happened in the Holocaust to open the Jewish wounds, this type of people. You know, then we have the hostage situation and we forgot ab about our morality. Instead of saying free the hostages, free the hostages, we go and say free Palestine, free Palestine. Instead of saying, free the people from conceptions, from ideologies, free individuality, empower individuals against the rotten system, we are empowering the system against the individual. Is this America? What happened to us? Is it the invasion of the social media that this fast we can just turn against our allies, against ourselves, and shoot ourselves in the head? This is how serious is this. This is not a political propaganda. I speak to you from the depth of my being. If we don't counter this danger, it is going to be chaos. It's already chaos. It doesn't matter what it is. If I have to choose, between giving Hamas legitimacy and dying, I choose to die. This is how serious is this. And these people failed, the what's so-called pro-Palestine, they failed to condemn Hamas up to now. 
I'm saying, okay, you advocate on behalf of the children and you are anti-war. Okay, understandable. But how come you haven't condemned a savage group like Hamas to call them out and say what you did on October 7 is not acceptable? And nothing can justify what happened. Don't tell me colonialism, occupation, etc. all the lame, unacceptable justifications. Nothing can justify a genocide. It's our moral responsibility. Then what's the point of all the educational institutions if we have failed the very basic moral responsibility? have about 20 minutes left, so we'll try to be a little bit quick. Thank you. Um, and again, please try to ignore the background noise. Apologies about that. So that leads us to our first question from Professor Shai Davidai, who's in the audience. Um, you mentioned the need to condemn Hamas. How do you feel about the fact that someone like the president of Columbia University still refuses to condemn Hamas? Well, I think it's a uh, moral decay. This is what it is. If the president of uh, one of the most respectful educational institutions in the country, in the United States of America, doesn't understand their moral responsibility, at least moral responsibility, to just say what happened on October 7 is not acceptable. Is it too hard to say? And this is what's in common, and this is why they are suspicious. All of them, what's so-called pro-Palestine movement, they are suspicious. There is stench that comes through them. Why? Because they have failed. They cannot, they cannot condemn Hamas. You know why? Because if they condemn Hamas, they lose their cause. They just want it in black and white. The right thing was from day one to say, no, we don't agree with Hamas. You are anti-war, it's your right. I'm not against it. Protest against the war. But you cannot protest against the war and let Hamas get away with their crime. And you cannot cry for the children and empower Hamas who's using them as human shields. It's hypocrisy. Our next question from the audience is, was there one particular moment where you recall having a sort of epiphany and deciding to leave your past behind you? You know, I lied to you if it was just a turning point. Uh, this is an evolution. You do, I did not come to realize all the things that I realize today just because other people told me. This is my life journey. You know, the things I say, I didn't go, let's say, to a Zionist school. You know, people say, this is Zionist propaganda. And I say, no, this is my first-hand experience. This is my own. I speak on my own authority. As a son of that region, as a friend of Israel, as a friend of the Jewish people, as an Arab. I am not a Palestinian, but I am an Arab. I don't take the Palestinian political identity because it's non-existential it does not even exist anywhere but there are Arabs I'm an Arab and I love my people I don't hate my people I want the best for my people I want to see them integrate so my personal journey we have to drop our false identities you know this is what can get you to a place of freedom where you can discern truth from falsehood I question myself every day. It's every day's responsibility to keep ourselves in check. Otherwise, we go wild. It's about discipline. So 45 years of human evolution that brought me here, it's not just you know, reading a book or becoming a friend with somebody who influenced me. It's very hard choices that you have to take. And this is why I tell my people, that you need to have the courage to drop the false identity. You know, as long as you identify with political entities, 
you are driven with the current. And nobody can swim against the current, by the way. I tried to swim on the surface. You get crushed. Not possible. And many tried. They did not like the current of the Middle Eastern society. But they were swimming on the surface. They couldn't make it. And they gave up very fast. But I had to learn how to dive. How to dive deep. To go below the current. Way, way below the current. Where there is no impact. But in order to do that, you need to learn some extreme things. You need to train your diaphragm. You need to be able to hold your breath for so long. Then you need to be able to run on very low oxygen and very high level of carbon dioxide. And may, you may black out. And when you wake up, you're going to find yourself at the ocean's floor and nobody's going to be there. This is what it means to swim against the flow of a society. You have to be very strong and you have to train yourself. Not everybody is capable of doing this. But instead of learning the lesson that there is no reason to be afraid, they sentenced me to death when I shared this book. They put a death sentence on me. My own family. The father that I loved. The father that I saved his life. Many times. I sacrificed my life. I choose the word to put betrayal here. But in reality it was love. I sacrificed my entire being to save his life. And his reward was to shun me. Why? Because he had to choose between his national and religious identity. And his oldest son. He chose his false identity. This is his problem. Not my problem. So as long as we are dealing with this collective consciousness where the people are not able to fight, to fight the good fight. I'm trying to give them the skill. No, you can't swim against the current. Just develop the skill. This is America. This is what it means to be individual and value our individualism. Otherwise, we're just sheep and we will stay in the cave of Plato for eternity. But what happens to those who get out of the cave? We all know the story, don't we? They get persecuted. They try to crucify us. And whenever we say the truth, anything that challenges their convenient narrative, they start labeling us that this is a traitor, it's not worthy. Is this how we're going to create the change? Is this how we're going to save the children and make sure that their future is secure from predators? Like the ones we are witnessing today. It's our responsibility. So it really doesn't matter you know, how I got here. It hasn't been an easy journey. And the journey is not over. But we have to fight. And all of us have the potential. We have so much power. We don't understand our potential. We can fight. And if it means to stay alone. To be alone. And in, in case we die. I prefer to die free. Not to live in slavery to any savage group. That brings us to the final question of the night. What do you see as the path for peace between Israelis and Palestinians? Okay, we try to close on a positive note. It's like the, the American happy ending and the, uh, inspired by the Hollywood, you know, that all the movies, thank God, you know, have to have like happy endings. Um, look, the way to peace is very clear. All we have to do just, we need to understand and know our responsibilities. Palestinians, before they uh, fight for their rights, they need to understand their responsibilities. Before they ask for a state, they need to become a nation. Before they uh, get power, they need to show accountability and responsibility by collecting a legitimate leadership. If they are not able to do this, then we cannot give them anything. But I think Israel is determined to give the Palestinians. Israel does not want to rule over the Palestinians. So there could be a governing authority. This is already happening in the West Bank. 
And I think if the Palestinians drop their violence today, and they say, Israel has the right to exist, finally, if they have that courage, because Israel is going nowhere. Everybody now realizes Israel is going nowhere. It means a global war if you try to annihilate the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Everybody is going to suffer. So what's the point? Why trying to do nonsense? Uh, wiping Israel off the map. And what, what today, by the way, do you think your students on campus and your university's president and many others who are validating groups to say from the river to the sea, from the river to the sea, they're asking for ethnic cleansing. They're asking for the Jews to actually pick up their stuff, leave their property, and go to exile one more time. How many times in the Jewish history this happened already? And they want it to happen again. They think that they have the right actually to ask for such absurd thing. This is what ethnic cleansing really means. In principle, when you say from the river to the sea, it doesn't matter that you kill the people. Sometimes you're just forced to displace them. And when these people spread the slogan from the river to the sea, basically they are saying more people join us of this crazy idea of wiping out a race, a human race, and destroying the only democracy in the Middle East. This is not the way to peace. This is the way to war. This is what Yasser Arafat and all the corrupt Palestinian leaderships have been doing for the past 70 years. And by the way, when they say from the river to the sea, Jewish cleanse, what so-called pro-Palestine movement, who's going to do the job on their behalf? Who's going to do that job? The children of Palestine will continue to die for eternity so this egoistic maniacs can have a moment of satisfaction and sense of righteousness that they are right. No, they are wrong, absolutely wrong. And I'm not at the corner of doubt. I'm in the place of certainty on that authority I speak that the free Palestine movement in the United States are complicit in Hamas crimes. Sooner or later you will realize this. Israel is going nowhere. So if we are talking about the way towards peace, then we need to drop these crazy ideas from the river to the sea because this is how the chaos began in the Middle East back in the day, when they start chanting from the river to the sea. So first of all, we need to realize that Israel is going nowhere and they have the birthright to be in this region. I give them that authority, I empower them. I'm a son of that region, I have that authority to say Israel has the right to exist. <laughs> Second, we don't have to jump immediately to a state. It could be a governing authority. We start with a governing authority, a simple one, simple police force. They don't have to have big guns. They just need a decent police force to keep things in order. Once we are able to stabilize the region, then we can construct it from there. Build economy, build education. It's a process. Building a nation is a process. We cannot jump to the state first. No, we have to invest our energy in creating the nation first. Once we have a nation and a leadership, then we can speak in terms of political entities. They follow just naturally. Nobody is going to stop that. And by the way, the Arabs had the, how many opportunities they had in the past. They, ha they, they were given by the British equal rights back in 1947 to build their Arab state. Israel declared their independence in 1948. The Arabs declared war against the Jews instead of declaring their independence. And they remembered to declare their independence 40 years after, in 1988. This is when they remembered to declare their independence. So many things happen in 40 years. We don't want to keep repeating missing opportunities. What we need from the uh, Palestinians to know their responsibilities, to show us a nation, 
show us accountability that they can be trusted when they are given territory and power I want to see women rights I want the Palestinians to stop the honor killing they have been killing women it's legitimate a father or a brother would kill his sister or his daughter for shame and they don't go to jail it's not considered a crime and you tell me we want to give them equal rights well show me equal responsibility first how do you treat women stop abusing children respect your neighbors so and by the way there's another thing that nobody's pay attention to stop racism against blacks you know you cannot agree as a society to call black people abid which means literally a slave this is racism it should be illegal then palestinians need to understand i'm not talking about also sexual orientation i see somebody shaking his head in denial why are you in denial i'm a son of that region i tell you this is what the people call black people they call them abid and abid means a slave this is what they you cannot call somebody hey whatever it's a crime here in the united states mean meaning okay okay it's, 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 i understand It's okay, it's okay. It's yeah, thank you so much. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, it is. It is. I'm not saying in the Arab world. I... We have two minutes, so. If you... It's okay, guys. He's got, he's got a point. He's got a point. Thank you. So you, you talk about being pulled by the currents of political ideology. I can, I can agree with you, I can agree with you, right, that being pulled by the political ideology of Islamism is completely incorrect and immoral. But it seems as though you haven't really dived too deep below the waters, and it seems that you're being pulled by a different current and a different ideology. And I think the ideology that you're preaching here is in more than one way Islamophobic. And let me explain to you why I believe so. I will equally condemn Hamas right here on the spot so we can all be clear in this room, right? Thank you for that. But, but what you are saying, but what you are saying, right? And you talk about the treatment of blacks, you talk about the treatment of women, right? You talk about the only democracy in the Middle East. You talk about Arab inability to forge nations, to forge countries. You talk about the lack of existence of Don't only talk about it. Let me, I support let me, let, it. Let me, I understand. That's, that's, you're making my point for me. Thank you. You talk about the lack of existence of a Palestinian identity. And uh, with all due respect, I know you're Palestinian, or some would say, some would say that you are. So you have a right to, you know, disavow yourself of that. But you do not have a right to tell other people that their identity does not exist. I believe that it is incorrect, it is immoral to say what identities do and do not exist, to dictate. That is almost the definition of being a bigot, right? And I'm not trying to name call right now, I'm just trying to see, call it how I see it, right? And so if we can both agree that we're going to condemn Hamas, but also equally refrain from being Orientalist, refrain from being Islamophobic, then we can have a productive conversation. But I am sorry, sir, your rhetoric is inflammatory. You trade in fear. You trade in fear. Now, you trade now you're in accusing me. One, one you're more. accusing Last point. me. You're closing not... point. Closing point. Closing it's your point. point to just closing, accuse me. Closing point. Closing point. Okay. I'm, I'm saying, I'm calling it right. how I see it, so feel free to retort. But this is my last point. So Samuel Huntington has this idea of the clash of civilizations, right? And I saw you spoke to Sam Harris. Sam Harris subscribes to this idea as well. But you portray this idea of the Islam versus the West. Islam versus the West. And I think this is a very, very dangerous idea. 
if we're both talking about Islamists, right, we can kind of get on the same page. But you say Islamist, but in your rhetoric you describe the Islamic civilization generally, proper, right? So let's just make sure we're getting clear about that. But I think that is inflammatory. I think that you're trading in fear. And I think that is very, very harmful. And that's, that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, look, you can call somebody who is not a familiar with a phenomena uh, that they have a phobia of that. Like someone has a phobia of something that is unknown to them. You can say that. You can say this about anybody who uh, did not grow up in that region. But as someone who went to a Sharia school, someone who memorized huge portions of the Quran, someone who speaks the classic Arabic, someone who studied so many Islamic denominations, you cannot accuse them. Are you listening to my answer? You see, you're busy right now, right? Suddenly I, I, you're busy. Listen, I heard exactly what you had to say, and I agree. Islamophobic But you want to is... debate me right now? Maybe after, maybe you wanna, after. But you want to debate me? Then you need to listen to me until I finish. Please. Sit down, sit down. Sit down, sit down and listen. Okay. So I speak on experience, long experience, a long, much longer experience than your experience combined. Not to reduce you, but have you been to a Sharia school? No, but I lived You haven't. Have you studied the Sharia? Have you studied the Sharia, the four major books of legislation? Have you studied them? So name the four main sources of Islam. Why you cannot do it? You said that you studied it. I need the sources. There are four main sources of Islam all Muslims agree on. What are, what are the four sources? You have Sunnah, you have Hadith, right? You have Quran, right? That's not it. That's not it. You forgot Qiyas and Ijma'. So please sit down and listen. Please sit down and listen. I am not, a, I don't have phobia of Islam. I was born in Islam. You cannot tell a cub that they have a phobia of cats. Because this is their environment. You know, you tell somebody who never been to the situation Islamophobic. But I, as a son of the religion, I don't have a phobia. I have the right to rebel. I have the birthright to rebel. I, I tell you something, if his, if I, I, don't, I don't mind speaking to him after the event, if this is what he wants, okay? And I don't mind actually debating someone. But the thing is, when you accuse someone, you must support. You know, you accuse me of Islamophobia. This is a big accusation. How can be uh, Islamophobic if this is my natural environment? You know, you cannot tell a fish to be, uh, that a fish is afraid of water. Well, I'll, you know, why don't this you have the sense. last word? Let me just respond Last very, very quickly. I, look, I don't, I don't believe that Islamophobia is a helpful word, right? I think bigotry towards Muslims may be a better one, right? But I'm just using the word that most people understand. When I say that, people know what I'm talking about, right? That's all I'm saying. But we can have this conversation. I wouldn't dwell over the semantics right now, but we could have this conversation more in depth. Okay, That's but also you need to understand. Thank you. Know, and I think Mr. Yusuf is saying he's not... Uh, look, a bigot, this uh, this but is, that if, if it was a different function, okay, and I can talk Islam with you all day long, I have no fear, I have no problem of discussing uh, religion, criticizing religion. It's our freedom in this country. You know, people criticize Christianity, criticize Judaism, they make fun of the gods. Why cannot I make <laughs> the fun of the gods, you know, that I was brought up? But anyway, this is not, this is not the right place. Look, I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but thank you for bringing the topic. We were focusing on Gaza. You tell me that you're from Sudan. You're about like 2,000 miles away. Have you ever been to Palestine or to Israel? You've never been there. So you shake your head when I said the black situation in the territories in denial, but you've never been there. <laughs> okay. Look, man, I am always, I like to build bridges, but false accusations, I don't like. And I don't like hypocrisy. I like free people who don't 
uh, hide in the crowd. I'm sorry, we really have to end. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, thank you for speaking up. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Ran. Thank you, Musab. I think it was a really great night.